I don't know anybody that's trans. I don't have any history. I, I feel like I'm alone. Uh, so that's how I kind of got started with looking and finding people just throughout history. So like, okay, I just need somebody to kind of look as like a role model. They turn, you know, they had, you know, challenges, but able to have a successful life. I wanted to actually see like, okay, instead of just what I was exposed to as a kid, which was Jerry Springer and daytime TV. Right, so, right. Or that I, idea of a, mm-hmm. a trans person as like a psychopathic killer. Exactly. Or, you know, a closeted gay man or, or some. Yeah, so, yeah. a lot of times are where the story always ends like, oh, and then they die. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, I would really like that to not be the, I'm, I'm kind of over those stories. The whole barrier sure. gaze trope. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, when we're looking at these historical documents and kind of combing through for, you know, people who have been sort of obscured or, or otherwise just aren't at the forefront, uh, I feel like a lot of people would say that we're rewriting history by looking at these mm. things. How would you acknowledge that? I think uh, it winds up being that we tend to erase. We, we, we have a long history of whitewashing uh Things where it's like, okay, well, we always go like, oh, well, these are the founding fathers. These are the people that – these are the men that started uh, Silicon Valley. The, you know, all these different things where we constantly always focus on men, typically white. Um, so I think it's important for all minority groups to actually be represented true through the history because there's a lot more complexity and a lot more diversity than what we were all taught. Yeah, so it's really less of like rewriting history and more just kind of like re-editing it to yeah. actually include people that weren't just, you know, rich exactly. white dudes. Yeah, I'd say we're rewriting history every time we talk about it, right? Yeah. It's We're always finding new things about what happened and new ways to describe it and new people to celebrate. So why is it only a problem when there are certain people being highlighted? It's, sure, mm-hmm. sure. Absolutely. Well, and, and then I guess the question is, why has it been so important to to the victors, the history writers, the frankly, the rich white dudes, uh, to, I guess, erase or cover up or just not even notice these stories? Um, I think it winds up being that, um, well, in academia, who's usually in charge, it's typically white cis male, who's in charge of writing the books, who's doing the publishing, it's they want themselves reflected. And I think there's kind of that thing of like, I want to identify with people. So they don't really identify with women. They don't identify with queer people. They don't identify with... So I think at at some level, I think it's kind of an unintentional bias Mm -hmm. a lot of times. Um, Then, of course, and there's also other people which intentionally are going like, I want to make sure that we believe that these people are inferior. Therefore, I'm going to erase this history. Yeah, cover up any accomplishment or anything. Exactly. Yeah, uh, well, with that, uh, go ahead and tell us uh, the story of Lynn Conway. We yeah, talked a little um, bit about her. It, she's uh, quite an interesting woman, and it's only been recently that they've kind of really discussed, like, what she actually did mm-hmm. as far as, like, within computer uh, tech. Uh, so she started working at IBM in around uh, 66 to 68, And her first uh, accomplishment was doing uh, out-of-order execution instructions, which basically allows you to do a whole bunch of different things like, oh, do this for a while, then stop and do this, which is a pretty big important part of, like, computers. Um, When she came out as being trans, she was immediately fired. Mm -hmm. Uh, She transitioned and then uh, went to work for uh, Xerox uh, over at Park. it's uh, if you ever see anything on Apple, it's where uh, Steve Jobs went and stole everything <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the story of it. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so uh, she goes on ahead. And uh, one of the things that helped her to get her foot in the door was the fact that um, at this time, most programmers were women because most men felt that using to actually type is a, is a woman's job. Therefore, they were completely turned off about programming. So this is what got her in the door. (laughs) So it it was sexism that gave her the opportunity to actually do this thing. Uh, Fantastic. So, so yeah, so it's kind of weird. Um, So her big, huge accomplishment was uh, VLSI, and that's Very Large Scale Integration. So before, what you would have to do is a whole team of people would have to go on ahead and they would have to physically etch the board. 
and you'd have to do this. So it would take 100 people, multiple engineering staff, months and months of work. So only the biggest companies could actually do this. Mm. So basically, she had the brilliant idea of like, hey, I've got this computer. I know the limitations of what the technology is. I just program and let the computer figure out a lot of the other minutia, and I can do it myself. Mm. So uh, she goes on ahead, and she does this. She shows it to Mead, and then he was like, oh, that's great. And then he started up a team to go on ahead and get started on that. And then she walked in on that team and was like, and one of the research assistants said like, hey, look at what Mead did. It's like, and it was all her work. Oh, God. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> so she was basically like, I'm not going to show him anything, and I'm just going to do this by myself. Um, so basically this um, essentially allowed you to do everything. So basically it winds up being kind of like the printing press. Because before, if a book was being made, it had to be done in, like, a monastery, and then all these monks would spend months and months writing, like, the Bible and things like that. Transcribing it by hand. Transcribing it by hand. So basically what she ended up doing was like, oh, I can now make it where one person can do it themselves, and all they have to do is just send it out to be printed, and then you're done. So instead of, like, months to actually do it, you can now do it in, like, a few weeks and design this so then it makes uh, 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 microchips much, much cheaper. Uh, she wrote the textbook. She um, went over to uh, MIT, got a class started, uh, then also integrated it where you could basically like, so the first six, seven weeks, you'd go on ahead, you'd learn how to use the software. The next seven weeks, you would design your own uh, microchip, and then you could basically uh, email it through a uh, uh, the early internet uh, <laughs> to uh, Xerox, and they would print it for you. And then a couple months later, they would mail you the chip you designed. Wow! And did it for like, like by 1981, they were already doing this at like over a hundred universities. So it's, yeah, so it's just really amazing thing. So it basically trained almost everybody. I, I have to just take a quick moment to point mm-hmm. out that my sixth grader was complaining about the fact that it took four hours for his computer lab to 3D print a tabletop Pikachu, <laughs> which I didn't even know that you could string all of those words together in that order. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But it's it's fascinating and baffling to put those things next to each other, mm-hmm. uh, but also just. I think highlights sort of the remarkableness of the creation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what basically ended up happening was, so if you look at trade magazines back in like 81, they were like, oh, it's it Conway and Mead, they did this, you know, and, and like you have it. Mm-hmm. And then by 89, it's now just Mead. And uh, by 2009, um, basically he was getting an award uh, in Silicon Valley as like as one of the, one of the, uh, founding fathers of Silicon Valley, oh, and uh, Conway didn't get the, the message, so she just happened to be visiting friends in California. So, wow. so basically she was like, uh, no, um, and she basically got all the documentation, compiled it, put it all online, and then basically said like, no. I did a lot of this work, <laughs> so she nice. finally got her credit. But she, you know, the reason why she didn't fight for so long was because she was stealth for so long. Mm. So I mean, it wasn't until about '99 when she actually started to kind of come out a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't really until about 2012 that she really was making herself known throughout the general public. Well, and, and just explain briefly, if you would, uh, what stealth means and why somebody would be concerned about, I guess, putting their name on their accomplishments. Mm-hmm. Uh, so stealth winds up being that um, for a long time that was what uh, trans people had to do was if you go on ahead, you transition, you need to never talk about it, never bring it up, never let anybody find out, never tell loved ones or anything, just mm-hmm. kind of pretend like it didn't happen. Basically just tell everybody that you're cis or let them assume. Exactly. And then it winds up being... And, but then at the same time, you're also like, what is a safety thing? And then it wound yeah. up being one of those things that it was uh, very much a bit more dangerous back then than it is now. Um, so it's understandable, like, why you would stay uh, closeted for so long. I mean, the the impulse is certainly very human. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we talk to folks every week on this show who are who are calling from places where they don't feel safe. And, you know, that really does come first. It is 
heartbreaking, however, to think that because of that that vulnerability, I guess, that I hate to even call it like a skeleton in the closet because that implies mm-hmm. that it is something to be ashamed of. But because of that vulnerability that you would, I guess, miss out on, on taking your rightful place mm-hmm. in the world. Absolutely. It's also a shame that, because I imagine that part of the reason, and correct me if I'm wrong, part mm-hmm. of the reason Lynn didn't want to put her name out there and actually say, no, this is get embroiled in that that confusion and that uh, controversy in the first place was because people would go digging and that would be exactly. the thing that would come out as something to discredit her yeah. and it would be used against her as a weapon. And that was the that was also another problem. Honestly, I was absolutely amazed that so um, before like it wound up being one of those things that they did actually contract a lot of the work out, like uh, DARPA basically pretty much bought a lot of it to actually be able to have it be open source. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually kind of amazed that when they did the background check that they didn't find out that she's trans. So I, I, I find that kind of amazing that she didn't get it discovered back in, uh, you know, 81, 82. Mm-hmm. Well, it, to me, I think kind of highlights just this whole exercise that we're going through and, and what we're trying to do here because uh, – even in the event that uh, somebody who is trans has the opportunity, has the access, has the chance to get an education, has the uh, positioning to be able to create something miraculous, we often won't hear about it or won't hear about it in that context because of that extra vulnerability, because of that safety piece. Yeah, uh, so beyond that, uh, who else did you want to speak with us about tonight? Uh, let's see here. So um, when I go a little bit back, it's going to be uh, a uh, an indigenous woman, uh, 